I found that you learn more from your mistakes than you do your successes because you have to back up and analyze and then fine tune and then try other things and and eventually if you keep trying enough you'll find the right path. Leadership is everywhere in our work, in our family, in our community. We see leaders by their actions. We know their legacy. This podcast is about leaders, people just like you doing amazing things every day. I hope these stories inspire you, they motivate you, and they fuel your leadership legacy. My name is Vicki Guy. Welcome to Ignite. Hi, and welcome to Ignite. Have you ever wondered how to just get started with your ideas? Well, before Jeff Galloway became America's coach and monthly columnist for the world's leading running publication, he was a world-class runner, Olympian, and the first winner of the Peachtree Road Race. Over a million runners and walkers have used his training program successfully, and he has authored over 30 books. He has introduced the joy of fitness to millions, and today, He is going to talk to us about the power of taking that first step. In just a moment, we'll be back to talk to Jeff. My name is Dana Morrison. I'm the IT director at Grace Christian School in Raleigh, North Carolina. IT directors often hoard so much knowledge that it's hard for their team members to learn. IT Pro TV has given us the ability to level up our technicians to a point where they can decide this is important for me to learn. I would recommend IT Pro TV uh, to any IT team. It's just a great tool uh, for any IT professional. Welcome back to Ignite. We are joined today with Jeff Galloway, who is a former Olympian and America's coach when it comes to running. Jeff, welcome to Ignite. Well, it's great to be here, and I really like the work you're doing. Thank you so much. You know, this podcast is really dedicated to telling stories about people who have done great things throughout their life to demonstrate leadership. And when I met you a few months ago, I knew absolutely that you had to be on this podcast to tell a little bit about your story. So I really appreciate you being willing to to share some of your story with us today. Glad to help. Yeah. So One of the things that I thought was really interesting when I heard you speak in in front of a large group not very long ago was that you got into running um, at a pretty young age. However, it didn't come so naturally to you. And you had mentioned that as a kid, you were not too terribly motivated to run and you may have been a little bit out of shape. Can you tell us a little bit about how those early days started for you and perhaps the turning point for you to get into running as a sport and a lifestyle? Well, I was very much out of shape. My dad had been in the Navy and I had gone to uh, 13 schools my first seven years. The 14th school, as I entered the eighth grade, required all boys to go out for sports or athletics or fitness in some way after school. And I hated it because uh, it always hurt. The coaches that I had been assigned uh, really made the workouts miserable. And so I shied away from it. But I couldn't do that at this new school. So I got to know some of the kids who were runners. And they actually uh, were funny. And they said that you had options on the cross-country team. You could just sort of run a little bit and hide out in the woods, which is what I did the first couple of days. But uh, as fate would have it, uh, an older kid discovered me and uh, he said, you're running with us today. And I got into it and sure enough, the jokes started flying and then they started telling gossip about the other kids. Well, I did not make it very far on those uh, first few runs, but on each successive one, I was out there again trying to go a little bit farther so that I could hear a little bit more of the gossip. And in the process, three things happened uh, within a week. First, I felt better even after the runs in which I was physically destroyed. I felt better in my head and in my spirit than I had ever felt in my life. Secondly, I was uh, struggling to find friends. Uh, new school, uh, 
I, I really just uh, didn't know anybody there. And within a week, I had close friends. This happens in just about every running group I've ever been in. People bond together right from the start. And you really get to know people and respect them. And the friendships become quite strong. And the third thing is that I was really struggling academically. As a matter of fact, when I enrolled in that cross-country course, I was right around the bottom of my class. And the other kids were mostly on the honor roll. Well, we got into arguments over various issues and things, and I realized that in the thought process, I wasn't any dumber than they were, and it totally reset my expectations of myself, and I found my way to the honor roll, too. So it, it was all about getting my feet moving, feeling the exertion, and then I found in my book, Mental Training, that that turns the brain on for a lot of positive things to happen. It's so interesting because what you describe is oftentimes what we talk about in, in a corporate setting, um, how if you just take the first step, then things are put into motion and unexpectedly oftentimes that momentum will carry you. And what it sounds like for you is that that first step or that first running group that you joined, maybe not willingly, but because you thought they were funny, helped you become more engaged in a lot of different aspects of your life. Not just the yes, I, no doubt about it. I have put on a corporate running event, walking event. Actually, it's mostly a walking event as a health promotion for Kaiser Permanente in Atlanta for now 36 years. And we find uh, company after company telling us that the training process in getting up to our event is very similar to what they do in their marketing or their logistics or whatever it is that they're involved with in their company. Well, I want to come back to that, Jeff, because I think that's a really important point to really talk about a little bit more with our listeners about just taking that first step to getting things done. But I want to kind of back up and tell a little bit more about your story and that that step that you took to become from that kid who was on track and was telling jokes with her friends to getting to the point where you became an Olympian. How did that transformation happen for you? What steps did you take to make that happen? It's a very slow process. It took 14 years, and it was very unexpected that I would end up on the Olympic team. As a matter of fact, if they had an election during my first five years of running, I would probably have been voted the least likely to succeed at that level of anybody that I was running with. Um, I just wouldn't give up, and I, because I wasn't naturally talented, I had to learn. So I read, and I interviewed coaches and athletes who were running very well, and I started sorting through all the stuff and trying things out. And I wasn't shy about trying to push myself. I made a whole lot of mistakes, but I found that you learn more from your mistakes than you do your successes because you have to back up and analyze and then fine tune and then try other things. And, and eventually, if you keep trying enough, you'll find the right path. You'll have a training method, which is what I've developed now over the years, that reduces the chance of getting injured to practically nothing. And it's just a wonderful thing. Well, I'm excited to hear about that as well. I'm hoping to run a marathon next year. <laughs> so I'll probably be using your techniques, but I want to hear about that. But I also, you mentioned something that was really interesting, and that is the ability to learn from your mistakes. And so often, we as human beings in general, we're afraid to make mistakes. And whether it's training for a marathon, or whether it is trying to learn a new skill, or whether it's running a project with our teams and our companies, whether it is, whatever it is, oftentimes fear of making mistakes holds us back. But it sounds like th that ability to take risks and learn from those really helped drive you and, and move you forward. Absolutely. And uh, writing my books, particularly the books on training, I have delved into a lot of anthropology to try to discover what we were really designed to do physically. And the anthropologists tend to agree that 
our ancestors were primarily long distance walkers. And, and we're talking about extremely long distance ultra marathon type walkers day after day after day after day. Uh, running was done in short segments. Mm -hmm. And um, so the whole concept is that you have to stay back of your limits. But uh, the whole uh, evolutionary process, both humans and other species, is really very well documented to be, if you don't know where you are or what you should do, do nothing. And, and this, we're programmed to do that. And it takes uh, some type of an affirmative step to be able to move off of that. Uh, but if you don't move off of it, you're really not going to learn as much and you, you, you're not going to do as well as you could. Again, it goes back to taking that first step and taking some risks. During that journey that you've had, and, and I, I know we could probably talk for hours about some of the experiences that you've had along your journey, what are some of the biggest things that you've learned that you can help others with? I know you've got um, a, a model and you've written books on, on the different types of running techniques and the different types of running um, plans that we're going to get into, but in just in, in terms of what you've learned that, that helps you the most to train and coach others, what has that thing been that's really helped you um, write the books and, and coach people that are interested in becoming better runners? Well, first of all, my experience in coaching people is mainly not derived from my own experience in moving up to the Olympics. Now, I learned the, the principles of that, but I didn't have a clue about specifics of dealing with beginners and people of all ability levels. So. I opened myself up uh, about uh, 35 years ago to anyone who had questions about running. And at first I sort of cringed at what I would get. And indeed, at various times I was overwhelmed with a lot of the questions and the number of questions. But it's been the very best thing for me in the learning process about coaching. And now I have given advice to uh, more than half a million people who are either walkers or runners. And that number has gotten back to me. So it's a huge database. And so what I do is I sort through the advice I gave and how it worked. And I've done that for about 40 years now. Uh, and in the process, I come up with the principles that work for various types of situations that people get into. So it's a reality-based program of coaching. And then over the years, I've gone a little bit further, and I've set up a number of cognitive tools that will give the people I'm working with control over their process and uh, reality checks on it, too, so that they know where they are. But the key components are setting a goal that's realistic. And uh, we have a uh, a couple of tests that will allow people to see what is realistic. And secondly, to set up the training program that doesn't overwhelm you. Uh, simply stated in endurance, it's just about moving your legs forward and gradually increasing the distance. Mm -hmm. So when you're training for your marathon, you can actually walk every one of the long runs and you will get the same endurance out of it. And so uh, there, there's not a lot of risk in terms of getting injured if you're doing long walks. Uh, and then in terms of getting into running, we, we have a method called the run, walk, run method. And it can take almost anyone in our society into running. Starts out with very short amounts of running followed by mostly walking. And some never get beyond that. We do not push people to run nonstop for any set distance. They need to find what works for them. And then finally, the other reason why people tend to succeed over those that don't um, is having some type of support, either a coaching program like I offer at my running retreats and, and so forth, or uh, our Galloway training programs, or the uh, uh, actual uh, friendship 
type oriented things that you'll find in running clubs around. If you've got a group that you can uh, go out and train with, you're just simply going to be more successful. And it's more fun too, right? To, to train in groups for sure. Yeah. Like I discovered in getting the gossip every, every day, it, it's, it is fun. Yeah, absolutely. And you know what really I love about what you've just shared with us is that the ability for you to, you said, open yourself up to questions. You didn't have any formal training on how to coach somebody to do what you've been able to do, but you were able to be, I, I'm going to use the word vulnerable, actually. You were able to be vulnerable and let people come to you and ask you questions about things that you may not had known at the time, but you learned and compiled information. And that's probably the power of some of the the concepts behind your theory um, and behind the method that you use in, in coaching as well is that it's based on just the vulnerability, the input, the stories, the testimonials from people that you've talked to over the years. It's pretty powerful. I had wonderful parents and they were my mentors in my coaching as well as a lot of the things that I do in life. And what they really modeled for me was being a good listener. And that, uh, I believe, is one of the key elements in being successful at a wide range of, of different areas of life. Well, on that, that's interesting because obviously mentors are really important to us and you've learned something from your mentors, your parents about listening. When you've had conversations with people that perhaps are maybe afraid to take that first step, they, they know they want to try your theory, try your methods, but they're something's holding them back. From what you've heard from your clients and the interactions that you've had, what are some of those things that hold people back? Well, the, uh, in terms of what holds people back, uh, they don't have the mental infrastructure to move forward. In other words, there's so many, the internet has presented us with so many different sources of information and most of it is pure garbage. And so a novice really has a lot of trouble sorting through the garbage from the gold. Uh, and, and so that's where a mentor or a coaching program or one of our retreats has been really beneficial because uh, it sorts through all, all that stuff and gives you a plan that is reality-based and successful. Um, the other thing that, that really holds people back is, is lack of support. And oftentimes they're not given support in their home environment. Uh, they don't have any friends that want to get involved in exercise. And so they're doing it by themselves. And there are all types of reasons why people would drop out in those situations. If you just have a friend sometimes, and one of the most popular ways to really have a mentor and support is to do something virtually in which you have uh, a friend and you text one another when you're getting ready for a workout and you may not feel motivated and, and you get this text back and by golly, you're going to get out there and do it because you got the text back and you, you keep in communication in, in some form. So it doesn't have to be a, an on-site person. It can be uh, some type of a virtual you know, Jeff, oftentimes when I'm talking to individuals and, and leaders in organizations and corporations, those two things that you just mentioned in running oftentimes play a role in what holds people back in terms of their career progression. And that is perhaps they don't have a framework or and or they don't have the support to help them reach their goals. And it sounds like that's exactly what you lean on as well within the methods that you that you promote. So let's let's talk a little bit more about those methods. I, we've kind of We've, we've uh, tiptoed around them a little bit. Could you give us just an overview of some of the best practices that you can give to somebody when they're trying to take that first step? They're trying to put their arms around the framework to find that support group. What are some of the first steps that we can, we can take? The most powerful concept deals with which brain operating system are you going to put in control over whatever it is you do. But this is more true in running than it is in most activities because um, the two different systems are first the ancient subconscious reflex brain and then our human brain, the conscious brain. Now the conscious brain is very small. It, it has one millionth 
the operating capacity of the ancient subconscious brain. So usually what our human organism does when we start to do an activity, uh, and let's say that you're going out the door to get your workout in, and you're thinking about all the things you have to do after that workout and how you're balancing life and everything. Well, what the human organism does in a case like that is it will defer to the ancient subconscious brain because you have learned to run, and so it will just trigger a behavior pattern that's embedded there in the ancient brain. And so you put one foot in front of the other. And there are a whole host of negative things that can happen when you rely on the ancient brain. First of all, it goes back often to the first time you learned how to run, which was, uh, for most people, racing another kid on the playground at school. And, you, of course, you were racing at top speed, so you start your easy run, supposedly, at a much faster pace than you should, and you're not exactly as young as you were when you were out on that playground, and your muscles aren't as resilient, and very soon you get into trouble. Well, what happens if you still allow the ancient brain to be in control is it's, it relates to the stress that you build up, and it starts triggering the release of anxiety hormones so that you're less motivated to go on, and then the negative hormones start uh, being dumped on you. Now, the fix from the beginning to gain control over your motivation is to have a cognitive strategy for everything you do. And this was a big breakthrough that I made when I got into coaching. Uh, I realized that I needed to give my coachees a plan. And the plan needed to be based on reality, what works. And so I researched and then I looked back on the people that I'd worked with and the ones that were successful. What was it that caused this to happen? What were the principles? In terms of distance running, there are several key elements here that can keep you under the control of your conscious brain. The first is you focus on what you're doing that day and you have a method to be able to get that done. Mm -hmm. And every time you have a method and you keep focusing on that, you're going to move step by step, but you're going to stay in the conscious brain. And that means the hormones are not going to be produced. Or if they start to get produced, you can go back into the human brain with a cognitive tool like a mantra and then a focus on the next step and you will get uh, in control over those hormones. They'll go away as long as you're under the control of the conscious brain. Uh, so building up your endurance and being able to control your pace are two things that we find in both in uh, running and in life that tend to make people successful. Whereas if you just go out and, and start doing something without a plan, you're going to reach a point where you hit a wall of some type, and, and then you're going to flounder around. Mm -hmm. And you, not only are you not going to go directly to success, but you're going to have a lot more problems along the way. Mm -hmm. And I imagine this is where you could make excuses along the way as well, because those things start to creep in that give you an out. And so without that strong framework and that plan, it would be easy to say, ah, maybe I'm not going to do this today. Absolutely. That's where the excuses come in. And, and it's very easy to give in to the problems. Mm -hmm. And then that next step in terms of the social support, um, without that, it would also be able, to, it would be easier for us to say, you know, because I know when I want to go to the gym in the morning at 5 a.m., and I don't have a gym buddy to go with, it's much easier to hit that snooze button and say, you know what, maybe I'll do this a little bit later or tomorrow. So also having that support group to be able to, to work within that framework um, that we know that works is really important. What about injury? I know we've talked a lot about injuries um, in the past. I heard you speak about injuries. One of the things I thought was really interesting when I heard you speak live was that a lot of the people that were in the room were... I would say non-traditional age to start their running technique, their running programs, and injuries were really a big concern. How does your method help address some of those concerns around injury? Well, most people assume that if they run, they're going to get injured. Uh, just about anybody that I 
sit next to on a plane these days who's not running will tell me that uh, that I'm going to have some serious uh, injuries uh, by running because they've heard it from their running friends. The reality is that running nonstop is certainly something that we were not designed to do. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the anthropologists believe that our ancestors mainly walked wherever they went, and they only ran to get away from a predator or short segments when they were on a hunt. And when we try to go a lot longer in our running nonstop than we were designed to do, then we're going to have aches, pains, and probably injuries. But if you have a plan, and the, my plan is run, walk, run, where you run a short amount of running and then you follow it up with a walk early and often, then you take away the stress buildup on weak links. All of us have certain areas that are more prone to aggravation than others. And if we don't address the buildup of stress on those areas, then it can build up to an injury even in one run. But if you have the right run, walk, run, and take control by adjusting it, if the stress builds up, you don't have to go through the negative stuff. Running does three major, it enacts three major brain circuits that transform your life in a positive way. It turns on the circuit for a better attitude, the circuit for more vitality, and the circuit for personal empowerment better than anything that has ever been studied. What my method does is take away the bad stuff so you can have all of those good ones, but none of the bad ones. So you said personal empowerment, um, increased mentality, a better attitude. and a better attitude. Those are huge, and, right? And vitality. Yeah, and vitality. Who doesn't want all three of those, <laughs> right? And, you know, again, I can't, as we were talking, I can't help, Jeff, but just notice that how all the things that you're talking about in terms of the running programs and coaching others to be able to, to hit their goals um, helps them physically, mentally, emotionally. And that's also not just for running, but it can be applied to pretty much anybody in any situation. So I really love the power of, of what you're bringing to the table with this. So um, any final thoughts in terms of, you know, the advice that you would give to somebody just in general and just getting started, whether it's running or anything else? Well, the, the whole concept is to pick a realistic goal, mm -hmm. then to set up a plan that's realistic and a proven plan. And I offer my website because you will find all types of plans and mostly uh, completely free information there, jeffgalloway.com. And then to focus on the plan and use your conscious brain for every single workout so that you're moving from one step to the next and you're staying away from the negative hormones that could come under stress. So the way a beginner would begin is by walking, gradually build up a walk to 30 minutes. At that point then they could start with short segments of running and I'm talking about only five to 10 seconds of running and follow it up with 30 to 60 seconds of walking. You're mostly walking. You're gradually introducing the body to the running motion. And if for any reason the running uh, amount is too much, walk for two to three minutes and start off with a more cons uh, conservative strategy. Mm -hmm. And by doing that and setting the plan up so that you gradually increase the length of one of your run-walk runs, you will be able to stay in charge over how you feel while you build your endurance and you adapt your body to the running motion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, Jeff, I'm looking forward to digging into some of the books that you've written and some of the articles also that you've sent. And we're going to share those with our listeners as well um, via our website. Um, and because, as I mentioned to you, I'm going to start training I think I'm going to make sure that those negative thoughts don't come into my mind and try to condition myself to run a marathon next year. Um, and I'm really looking forward to, to using your methods in helping me be successful. So thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate you joining us on Ignite and sharing some of your story with us. And um, any final thoughts? Well, I'm very pleased to help you. And if you have any questions or your listeners have any questions, you can go to jeffgalloway.com. There's a free email service there. And 
we'd love to see you at some of our retreats, like the Carmel retreats in uh, Blue Mountain Beach, Florida, and Tahoe. They're really wonderful, upbeat, motivational sessions. Jeff, thank you so much for joining us today. We will be back in just a few minutes with some final thoughts. Enjoying Ignite? Then you'll want to check out TechNado, another podcast from the IT Pro TV network. In each episode, hosts Peter and Don recap the week's top tech news and interview IT experts from around the globe. Learn more at itpro.tv slash podcasts. So cool to talk to Jeff, and what an easy thought to hang on to, just taking that first step. We know that that is the hardest part, but definitely the most critical. Thanks for being with us on Ignite. Please subscribe to our podcast and check us out on orendaleadership.com and at itpro.tv. From all of us here at Ignite, I'm Vicki Guy. 